Good morning, family. Good morning. Uh, as we get started this morning, we have a couple of announcements. The men's group will be meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m. to just kind of put together the planning for the Mother's Day dinner. So if you are a gentleman or a man or a young man and would like to get involved in that meal that is prepared for the mothers and the sisters and the women on Mother's Day, uh, go ahead and come join us and find out some other things that we're doing as well. Uh, we're, we get into different ministries. So uh, also the council meeting, the council meeting will be this Monday at 6 p.m. 6.30, 6.30, we got the half in there. So uh, we got that going on. Um, you know, have you ever, have you ever felt just overwhelmed, busy, kind of chaotic, and then you just can't slow down because life is happening around you? And it, you're going 100 miles an hour, and you run into people throughout the week, and at times you just kind of want to turn away and do your own thing. You see, we just got done celebrating Easter, we had baptisms, we had a church full of people, and it was a phenomenal day. And we recognize that Jesus Christ rose from the cross, that he had died on that cross and he rose from the dead, and he had risen. We celebrated that. But now what? You see, now we return back to the world and we go into the world and we try to figure out how do we adjust as Christians to that. You see, when we, we live it out. We live out the grace and the mercy that he poured out on that cross and that love and that compassion to those that are around us. And we actually have to take a moment and stop and recognize Christ in our lives wherever we're at during the day. And so it can become overwhelming. And we just feel defeated at times. But when we come together as a family, as Seville Community Church of God, and wherever you're at, we want to do that with love and compassion and mercy and grace, just like our, our, our Father allowed His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for us. We want to submit our time and be available to you as pastors, as elders of the church. You're not in this by yourself. And so when you come here on Sunday, we want you to seek out and ask for that guidance, ask for that prayer, and take that time to come together. We have several small groups that are available for you to get involved with. We have pastors that are willing to be there in your time of need. But see, today, we're going to give glory to God because we made it through another week and we're going to get re-energized in the Holy Spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ. Because He rose from the dead for us to be able to know Him in a way that we can have that love. Let us go ahead and pray and give Him glory. Father God, we thank You so much for Your Son, Jesus Christ that he would bear that cross, that even when he couldn't carry it any longer and he was on his way to the crucifixion, that you would provide somebody to help him lift that cross up, that you would give him a man that would be able to be there in his time of need. Lord, we just ask that you would be here with us at Seville Community Church today that you would touch those that need to be touched in a way that they would be able to have an interaction with you, Lord. That they would feel that love, that compassion, and that mercy, and that grace that only your Son, Jesus Christ, can give by dying on that cross. That we can have that relationship with you, Father. That when we accept your Son, Jesus Christ, as that sacrifice, that we can begin to mend those relationships that we have with those people that are around us in our world today. That we can be at work and we can be wherever it is, whether it's the grocery store, no matter where it's at, Lord, we would ask that you would be with us. Lord, we would ask that you would continue to be with the community. That you would continue to be with our leaders. That you would be with our first responders, Lord. 
That you would be with those that are sick and suffering emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. That they would know that you are present here today. That you are the same in the beginning as you are in the end, Lord. That your word is true. That no matter what the people say around us, that we can rely and depend and know that your word is always the same. And it is the only truth. Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you continue to do. We give you all the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? All right. Good. All right, so I have a question. Raise your hand if you were here when Pastor Showers was here. All right. So I was just thinking all the day. I don't know. It just popped in my head. And I always loved when he said, well, today is April 16th. You better shake hands with 16 people. Right? All right, so I want you to stand up this morning. I want you to shake hands with 16 people. birthday is today. So, as I was thinking, why do I give to her? Right? On birthday, this is a custom we have. We give each other gifts. But I was thinking, why? Why do I give to her? It's not because I want her to love me. Because she already loves me. Because I'm her husband. She's, I'm hers. So, she already loves me. So, I'm not buying her love from that. In that same way with God, God loves us no matter what. He loves us so much even before we were knew him. So we don't give to God for love, right? Same way when I'm thinking of, of Jamie. So when I get when I give something to her, what, what's my motivation here? And I, and I start thinking, well, actually when I pick something out or give her a gift, it comes about out of our mutual account. Because... It's the same account. We're married, the same account. We share that. And I think, well, I'm kind of buying her out of the same account of her money, right? This is weird. But as we think, as Christians, we're, we're stewards. So everything that we have is God's anyway. So when we give to God, we're actually giving out of God's account as well, in a sense. And I was thinking of these, these going back and forth while I was, while I was thinking about giving thinking about how, how our heart towards that person we give to. And, then, and when I give to Jamie, when I give, buy her a gift, it's because I love her. I want to show her that this is, uh, that I'm dedicating this portion to her. I could have went out and bought something for myself. Instead, I give it to her. And I, and I think, I want, uh, I want her to know that I'm thinking about her. I want her to know that she's special to me. I want her to know that, you know, the money doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the love that we have together. And as I continue to link those, I thought the deepest relationship, earthly relationship I have is with my wife. There's no other relationship higher than that. But my relationship with God is greater. That connection that I have with God, that relationship with Him, with my Creator, is even greater than the relationship I have with my wife. So as we prepare our hearts today, we're going to have the ushers come forward for the tithes and the offering. And we don't give for his love. We don't give for some sense of um, trying to be worthy. Instead, we give because we love him. And it's not only with our tithes and our offering. Same thing with when I show love to Jamie. It's not just gifts. God tells us to, uh, there's multiple ways to do exactly, um, to praise God, and that is to give to others, have love how we interact with each other is, is giving God glory. Let me pray and we'll, we'll let the ushers come forth. Jeremy, Father, Lord, we thank you for your love today. We thank you that 
that you're here with us. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you that as we continue to <coughs> go through the, soft, the service, that you soften our hearts, Lord. Lord, thank you for this realization that, that you have given us everything. Every <coughs> blessing is yours. Lord, we thank you for the remembrance of what you've done for us on Easter. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that you loved us so much while we were sinners, you died for us. Lord, as we continue through this life, as we continue through these days that you've given us, help us to continue to pour out our love and adoration towards you. Lord, be with us as we go through this service. Be with us through our through our troubles in the week, but be with us through those, the good, the bad, and everything that happens, Lord. We just ask you to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. get our minds ready in worship to receive God's word. Last week was so awesome. We celebrated an empty tomb, uh, something Christians have been doing for over 2,000 years, and we celebrate actually every single Sunday. In fact, that's why we gather on Sundays is to remember the empty tomb that Jesus had his last supper on Thursday, was crucified on Friday, Saturday, we waited, Sunday, the tomb was empty. Every Sunday we celebrate the empty tomb. Last week gave us an opportunity to really dive into that and uh, break bread together, eat together, and be together. Today we're going to jump back into our series in Ephesians that we just started uh, we're going to finish, finish up the first chapter. Let me remind you what Ephesians is. Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to be circulatory. That means it was a letter to the general church. Sometimes Paul wrote specifically to an individual church like Corinthians, the church at Corinth, and he'd be very specific about specific people and specific events. But this is a general epistle written to the church at large. That means it's written to you. It's written to Seville Community Church of God. So we're going to spend the next several re weeks going through Ephesians where Paul really talks about living the Christian life. So these messages are for the believer, not the unbeliever. There's a certain part of church that's uh, evangelical. That means we try to proselytize or try to uh, bring people to a knowledge of Jesus. Uh, this series isn't that. This series assumes you've already made the decision to follow Jesus. It's not that you couldn't hear this message if you weren't uh, a non-believer, but it's really an internal letter. It's, a, it's an inner office memo written to churches or believers already. So the first part, we looked at and established what Ephesians was. Uh, Matt preached last time from Ephesians where Paul was talking about the spiritual blessings that we've been given in Christ. He did a phenomenal job. I'm going to finish out chapter 1 uh, from uh, verse 15 all the way to verse 23. And it's kind of funny because it's one sentence. Except for verse 21, there's a period, and then verse 22 is another uh, run-on sentence. But the entire, uh, most of what we're going to read today is one sentence. Paul has a tendency to do that. He does these long run-on sentences, and part of it, I think, is maybe he would be diagnosed with ADHD if it existed back then. Where he starts writing, and then he's like, well, God is so good, and he, he goes off on these uh, parentheticals or these uh, these uh, other um, adjectival statements about what he just said. And anyways, big, long, run-on sentences. So they're kind of hard to decipher. So we're going to take it just a little bit at a time. First, let me read the entire scripture to you. And then we're going to dive in and look at just a little bit at a time and pull out what Paul is uh, trying to say. So 
Um, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the workings of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in the heavenly places, far above rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, sentence one. Far above all, or and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Whew. Well, one long breath, one long sentence. Let's look at a verse at a time or a couple verses at a time. First with verse 15 uh, Paul says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, for this reason, that is, the believers, you are given every spiritual blessing. It's what Pastor Matt talked about last time we were in Ephesians, that because you believe and have faith in Jesus is who he said he was, you are automatically gifted spiritual blessings. Because of that, because you are a believer, for that reason, that's what Paul is saying, is why he's going to say this next part. And he says, Paul heard, through the grapevine, maybe, the California reasons, you guys remember those? Yeah. <laughs> Paul heard about two things. He heard about their vertical adoration of God. When I say vertical, we talk about our relationship <laughs> with the Heavenly Father. How do we? Uh, how are we in relation to our heavenly fathers? Paul heard about this. Paul heard about how this church or these believers, or not specifically, but believers in general, he heard about their relationship with God, and then he also assumes their horizontal relationship changes. When our vertical relationship with Him changes, our horizontal relationships—that's that's our human relationship—automatically change. Listen. A proper relationship with God leads to a proper relationship with other believers and people in general. When we get our relationship with God right, our relationship with everybody else around us is right. When our relationship with God is wrong, we can't possibly enter into any other relationship and think that it's going to be right. Paul is going to labor this all throughout Ephesians. It's this important concept. A proper relationship with God leads to a proper relationship with all other believers or all other creation. Okay? Let's look at 16 and 18. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his uh, glorious inheritance in the saints? He says, Paul says, a spirit of wisdom. That's twofold there. There's the term spirit, which denotes our attitude towards something. So, his spirit was low, we could say in, in English today. He had a low countenance or his spirit was low. He was in a bad mood. His spirit was perturbed. That's one sense. The other sense is the Holy Spirit. And they go hand in hand here because Paul has a theology that says, if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it changes your spirit. The, the thing that governs your actions, your will, as it were, will. So he's talking about both there, and he's talking about a revelation. That is not just a head knowledge. You can know a lot of things about God. Demons know a lot of things about God. 
The devil knows a lot of things about God. In fact, I would say probably more than you do. Probably more than I do. But it's not a saving knowledge. The knowledge he's talking about is a personal knowledge. Do you know him? Do you know him? Are you in relationship with him? Why? Well, he says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So what Paul is saying is, if you know Jesus, you know God, and are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you have a hope within that he's called you to. Let me unpack that a little bit. The world, church, is without hope. It's without hope. The world says, know thyself. Eastern religion says, know thyself. Every other religion says, look inward. Look inside and find the answer. Look inside and find the good. And many other religions teach that uh, people are mostly good. No, they're not. The Bible is antithetical to that. It's the opposite. In fact, in the 80s, we, we're still living in this movement called the esteem movement that was very popularized in the 80s. And the, 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 the mindset behind that, the, the theology, as it were, uh, the theory behind that was we're too hard on kids. In fact, um, you know, if you're a teacher... Uh, in this negative reinforcement idea and correction is very damaging to children, and we shouldn't do that. Um, and that was really popularized by uh, a gentleman uh, that grew up in a Catholic school, and he was they were very hard on him, and so he rebelled against that. He became an adult, and he's got his doctorate in, in childhood education and, and all that, and he popular, popularized this theory of affirmative, affirming people or redirecting their behavior to the point where you don't offer correction. You esteem children. That you make sure that and you don't correct them negatively, use a negative connotation. It's the esteem movement. And Christianity says, uh, know God through Jesus Christ, not from within. Be corrected if you're wrong. The esteem movement says, here's a trophy just for playing. In fact, you didn't even have to play, here's your trophy. In fact, you don't even have to finish out, just we want to recognize any possible good that you might have done and artificially inflate that to the point where you become entitled and now we have a problem. Does that make sense? We see it, right? We see it within our own lives. We see it with us. It leads to instant gratification. It leads uh, us to the false knowledge that uh, I deserve fill in the blank. And you suffer from it too. How do I know this? Well, next time you go through a drive-thru and they mess up your order, how do you feel? Upset. They didn't get my stuff right. Are you kidding me? You get terrible service or something doesn't go the way you want to. We're all uh, reeling from that movement and probably will reel from that movement for a while. But Christianity says the opposite. Paul is saying the opposite. Christianity says no God through Jesus Christ. And you're going to be disappointed if you're searching for goodness from within. Goodness is from an external source. Instead, no God that you may have hope to which he has called you. The hope that's lacking in the world is this hope that the Bible is talking about. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever felt anxiety. Let's be honest. Of course. Anxiety is worry about the imminent or about the future. It, it's, the, uh, it's proportionate to our faith in whatever we think is in control. Let me say that again. So anxiety is worry about the imminent. And it's proportionate to our faith in whatever we think is in control. We are anxious about the test results. And I'm really, really anxious about what the doctor's going to tell me or what treatment I have to go through or what the plan of, uh, of is going to be. There, there's anxiety there. Um, 
Will I have enough money at the end of the month? It's an anxious idea. Will so-and-so show up when they're supposed to show up? Paul's prayer, and he's praying right now for you, for the church, his prayer is that you would know the one who actually is in control, and knowing him is the hope. Knowing him is the hope. If you really know that, you wouldn't be anxious. And I'm not telling you that uh, your anxiety is a sin and, and that you can somehow uh, turn that off like a switch. I don't, I don't want to cheapen that or make that seem really easy because I, I understand that. I feel anxious about things I can't control. But let me show you, i give you maybe an example um, that can help you wrap your mind around this. Let's pretend we used to play uh, football on the schoolyard in elementary <laughs> school. Right, raise your hand if you did that. We'd get together and we would uh, play full-out football, tackle and everything. And um, let's pretend you're playing schoolyard football. The bell is about to ring. Your team is down by three points. You have one more play to, to score a touchdown. You have to score a touchdown or you're going to lose. Uh, so who do you call in? Well, maybe you call in Bad News Bobby. We'll call him. Bad News Bobby. He's not the biggest kid by any stretch of the imagination, but he's kind of scrappy, and sometimes he does good when he runs the ball. Sometimes he drops the ball, uh, but he's got a very good-looking girlfriend. Plug to my wife there. <laughs> Some of you are putting this together. Sometimes he does okay when he runs the ball, but... Uh, so some of the team would probably feel anxious. If you're on the team, you probably feel kind of anxious, right? I don't know if we're going to win. I'm not really sure we've got one shot to do this, and Bobby's here, and we've got to give him the ball. Some of you are like, I don't know. I feel pretty, pretty anxious about that. What if I said you could call in Bobby, or you could call in Barry Sanders at the height of his career? The so Barry Sanders, at the height of his career, comes to your elementary school, and now he's drafted on your team, and you got one shot to score a touchdown. Is Barry Sanders going to score a touchdown? Oh, yeah. We're like, heck yeah, he's going to score a touchdown. Are you kidding me? He's going to crush these third graders, right? <laughs> so Barry Sanders versus third graders. You put all your chips on Barry Sanders, right? That's our guy. That is the contest I'm talking about. When we think about life, it's in relation to that. When we put uh, things into perspective, we go, wait a minute. I got God on my team. I know it's coming down to the wire, and it doesn't look like there's a lot of time, and we only got one shot at this, and we remember, oh, it's not on me. It's on God, and it's a sure bet. It's a sure bet. That's the hope. Paul is praying that you and I feel about everything. Knowing him is that kind of hope. Paul is praying that for your relational knowledge of God that gives you this kind of hope that the world knows nothing of. The world knows nothing of this kind of hope. The world says, put your hope in your identity, your sexuality, your gender, your job, your spouse, your family, your vacations, your money. The world says, place your hope there, and we're left feeling anxious, rightly so. Paul's like, I pray that that's not the hope you're filled with. I pray that you're filled with this kind of hope. And man, if you would realize it. So Paul is praying for that. It, it reminds you of your inheritance. So Paul wants you to remember that you're royalty, that you have an inheritance. And you would realize, verses 19 and 21, what is a measurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and the power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. The, the power, the word there in the Greek is uh, dynamos, is where we get the word dynamite. And power kind of falls short. But the idea, the kind of power that Paul is talking about is a living power. It's an unceasing power. And it's a living force in three areas. 
The first area mentioned here is when Christ was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms. That's the first act of that manifestation of power. That is the spiritual realm breaking into the physical realm. Understand that. That's the spiritual realm breaking into the physical realm. That is God stepping into his creation. He said that's, that's the first manifestation of that power. God stepped into our world while remaining in his. Bridging the gap between the physical and the spiritual. Verses 22 and 23 and he put things, all things, under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The first manifestation of that living power is Jesus Christ raised from the dead. The second manifestation of that power is placed in Christ, placing all things under the feet of Christ. Another way of saying placing all things at the feet of Christ is saying Jesus is on top of everything. Pecking order, numero uno. The tip of the spear, the top of the top, it don't get any higher in created things or spiritual things. Paul saying Jesus is the top. The third manifestation of his power He's the head of the church. Now, I gotta, I gotta clear up some misconceptions that you're automatically thinking. When I say the word church, you're, you're probably automatically thinking of burgundy chairs in this place out on 46. Right? For being honest, when, when I say church, a lot of us think building with a cross at the front located on M46 here. That is not what Paul is saying here. When he says ecclesia, the, the Greek word for church, what he's saying is the gathering or the assembly of. He couldn't care less if it was in the middle of the woods, in a desert, or in a beautiful building. Paul is saying the third manifestation of Jesus is the church. So the power entered into the physical realm through Jesus, that burial and resurrection of the cross, Jesus is then the head of everything physical, and his body then is the church, the assembling of the saints, the assembling of the believers. Why is this important? Well, because he made it that way. Let me ask you this. Can you be the hands and feet of Jesus if you're not gathering? And I'm not saying in this particular building, with this particular congregation, but reading this scripture, can you be the body of Jesus if you're not gathering? Not very well. You'd be like Jesus with little tiny hands if you're trying to do it by yourself, right? Maybe Jesus with a little scrawny body if you're trying to do it yourself, right? But when we gather together as an assembly around Jesus, the more we gather, guess what? The stronger we are, the more we can do. So we gather, in this particular case, as a denomination, so that little country church in Seville can send people to Bangladesh or India and plant churches all over the world. We couldn't possibly do that on our own, could we? See, when churches gather together, again, not buildings, when churches gather together, you know what happens? The whole orphanage system gets invented. Universities get created. That was a Christian thing too. Stuff we take for granted every day, hospitals, medical care, or here's a big one, reading. All church ideas. All under the guise of assembling together as believers. I know a lot of those institutions have far removed God from their minds and they don't read their history books. They don't go back far enough to see where their roots came from. I'll give you that. But that's irrelevant here. Paul is saying the body of Jesus is the church, whether you like it or not. It's the gathering, and we are together. You're, you're not supposed to go through life as a solo sport. Now, people leave churches all the time, don't they? 
They do. Trust me, I know they do. People leave churches all the time, but uh, do you need to assemble? Well, my question is, and, and I get this sometimes, well, Pastor, now I can be a Christian and I don't really need to go to church. Now, what they mean is I don't need to go to a building, but what I think is they don't need, they're, they're saying and they don't even realize, I don't need to assemble or gather. I don't need to assemble or gather. Paul knows nothing of that. Paul knows nothing of the unassembled church. It's, it's content contradictory to the term itself. So the question that I ask is, well, who are you assembling with? Because I guarantee you, you're assembling with somebody around something, and there's a head. Could be beer league, pool. Could be the dysfunctional family gathering. I guarantee you, you are assembling and gathering with somebody. That's the question I ask. Who's at the head of that? Political figure? Your guy? Your gal? I guarantee you the head of your assembling isn't as perfect as the head of my assembling. Amen? And we have learned as a church to never talk about that. We have learned as a church to never go proselytize and talk to the people because it's politically incorrect because our views don't match up with society, because uh, it's impolite to try to convert somebody to your way of thinking, I have news for you. Every conversation you have with every single person that you ever come into contact with is trying to convince you or convert you to their way of thinking. The head of my thinking is Jesus. You got a better guy? I didn't think so. If you believe Jesus is who he says he is and you have the hope that Paul is praying that you do have, you can't not talk about it. <clears throat> Paul's going to go on in Ephesians to do that. He ends the prayer after demonstrating that believers have all spiritual blessings. Pastor Matt preached on that. Then Paul prayed that believers would come to know God intimately, not just a, a head knowledge, but an intimate relational knowledge of God in order that they may know three things, that the past call of salvation that produced hope was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That the future inheritance that God has with his saints is brought about by the church. Jesus is coming again. And the present power that I just labored talking about, the one that rose Jesus from the dead, is available to you. Not to gratify and meet your physical needs or your, your wants and desires, but to build the kingdom, which was made possible by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and is manifested most fully through his church. Most fully through his church. Let's remember that as we go. And you'll see... Paul dive into this even deeper uh, next week where we talk about what faith is and how we are given grace through faith. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to gather here. Father, our prayer today is that you would help us realize our calling. That our calling is to be your hands and your feet. Give us the strength to live like it. Give us the knowledge and the wisdom to be the church, not just pretend church, but to be the church and be your body. Father, bring us opportunities this week that we can proclaim the good news of what we celebrated last week, your death, burial, and resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things and the entire church said Amen. Let's all stand together and respond in worship. <clears throat>